Uh, the first speaker, is Michael Bagnard, it was our presidential candidate in 2004. He happens to be from Indiana, and as an aside, not on his bio sheet here, his mom was our candidate for lieutenant governor that year, and we really appreciated her efforts there. Uh, Michael is a constitutional scholar and the author of Good to be King, The Ender's Guide to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He was our presidential candidate in 2004. In 2006, he ran for Congress out of Texas, and was elected president of the Continental Congress in 2009, which met in St. Charles, Illinois, to document the government, uh, government violations of the Constitution. Michael's been studying the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, and the history of the American Revolution for 30 years. He's been teaching very early, he began teaching very early in life, and has developed a teaching style which is extremely effective and entertaining. He is a teacher you always wish you had. If you have not already signed up for Michael's introduction to the Constitution class being held tomorrow, please consider registering today. I understand it's filling up quite rapidly. Uh, you will find this class both entertaining and enlightening. Uh, Michael Bednar, our 2004 presidential candidate. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a uh, bright early morning, and uh, here we are gathered in LaPorte, Indiana, to uh, make a difference, to change the world. I am I'm happy to be here. Indiana is my home state, and uh, we'll be returning here to take care of my parents. Uh, they raised my brothers and I and did such a great job. I figure I should you know, be here to kind of help them out a little bit. But I was invited to, to speak today. And, you know, before I, I speak, people will talk to me, and if I mentioned that I'm nervous, they go, what are you nervous about? You know, all they want you to do is go and speak for 30 minutes. <laughs> well, no, that's not true. If all you wanted was noise for 30 minutes, we would just like pick straws and whoever got the short, short straw would come up and, you know, tell their favorite jokes. I mean, the reason that I am requested as a speaker is so that I can be motivation. Well, I'm always trying to improve, and so I actually looked up the definition of motivational. It says that process that arouses, sustains, and regulates human and animal behavior. So a motivational speech isn't just where you go, oh gosh, that was really good. You know, it's going to cause you to do something. Now, I would consider this a motivational speech if at the end everybody stood up with pitchforks and burning torches and goes, let's go hang the bastards. That would be a motivational speech because some action was derived from the sound of my voice. So frequently I use quotes from the Founding Fathers. The Founding Fathers, I mean, they did all this. You know, when you're young and you go, God, I got this really, you know, terrible problem. You go to your parents and go, Mom, Dad, you know, like, you know, can you help me with this problem? They go, well, sure, this is easy. Well, it's easy for them because they've already done it. They've already struggled through it, and they know the answer. The answer is pretty easy. So the Founding Fathers have already struggled through all the same stuff that, that we are complaining about today. So one of my favorite Founding Fathers was Patrick Henry. And I like him because he was so mild-mannered. <laughs> Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against the painful truth, to listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be the numbers of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. Hopefully, I am stepping into Patrick Henry's shoes and I'm going to tell you the whole truth, to tell you the worst, so that hopefully you will be motivated to prepare for it. Our economy is going to crash. This is not some theory 
This is not some, well, okay, money's going to be a little bit tight. We already have 20% unemployment. Already. Now, I understand the mainstream media has downplayed that. They're giving us like, you know, 9, 10%. And we all believe the mainstream media, don't we? Okay. My brother works for Ford Motor Company in Detroit. Okay, most of the guys that he used to work with are gone. You know, they're, they're selling their property. People are leaving Detroit. My brother, you know, works 12 to 16 hours a day just so that he can keep the job that he's got. And my brother's telling me there's no economic problem. He's embarrassed because I tell people the economy is going to crash. I mean, how ridiculous. You know? If you and I sit someplace and print $20 bills off my special laser printer, we can rent a limo, go out for surf and turf. I mean, we can be living large. This is going to be fun. Well, right up until they catch us. And then we go to jail for counterfeiting. $10,000, you know, they look like good 20s to me. But we'll go to jail for a long time for counterfeiting $10,000. The Federal Reserve has been count counterfeiting our money since 1913. Literally quadrillions of dollars. And I still have people tell me, well, we can't get rid of the Federal Reserve. That, that's crazy talk. Not getting rid of the Federal Reserve is crazy talk. <laughs> and people say, well, you know, that can't happen here. You know, this is the United States. How many people are familiar with the Weimar Republic? This is Germany between World War I and World War II. Germany started the First World War and, and we bitch slapped them and said, oh, you guys are really bad and terrible and awful. And so we had all these war reparations. Germany had to pay a fine for, you know, like starting this big ruckus. Except we wouldn't allow them to do any kind of manufacturing, they weren't allowed to grow certain things. You know, you owe us all this money, but you can't do anything to actually earn it. I mean, catch-22 situation if I ever heard one. And so the German government did the only thing left possible. They were printing money. They printed so much money so fast that if you went into a grocery store there would be one price in the morning, another price in the afternoon, and yet a third price in the evening. And I have people complaining to me that the cost of gasoline went up again this week. It's like, yeah, you haven't even seen hyperinflation yet. Wait until the price of gasoline is on one of those little counters they're not counting the gallons being pumped, they're counting the price right now. <laughs> it's already almost four dollars, and before this whole thing is over, I mean, it's definitely going to be double digit. Nobody's going to go anywhere, because you just won't be able to afford the gasoline. Now, in the Weimar Republic, and you can go to my website and look, I have photographs of actual German marks. One mark, five marks, a hundred marks, okay. 500, 10,000, 20,000 mark. When was the last time you saw anything higher than a $100 bill? Anybody even seen a $500 bill? And we're talking 10,000 marks. Oh, we're not even in the decimal places yet. You know, a million, 500 million, you go down to the bottom of the list and there is a one billion mark note. 1,000 million marks on one piece of paper. And that wouldn't even buy you dinner. When I was growing up, my mother was telling me that, Michael, they, they carried money in a wheelbarrow. And I thought, okay, I get it, Mom. Things were expensive. Because, it, you know, certainly she's exaggerating. You know, she wants me to understand that, you know, life was difficult and that it was expensive. And so she's kind of like exaggerating. She's painting this desperate picture of people, but they didn't really do that. Yeah. Yeah, they really did. Shopping bags, wheelbarrows full of money because the money was worthless. I have 
a five trillion Zimbabwe note. I don't know if they're dollars or what their unit of measure is, but it's five trillion of whatever the Zimbabwe units are. And their money is more valuable in the United States as an oddity. Look, look, I got a five trillion dollar Zimbabwe note. It, that gets you more money in the United States than it will get you in Zimbabwe. How many people have been to Mexico? If you look on the ground and you see a peso on the ground, you won't even pick it up. It's not even worth the energy of bending over. But if you see a washer on the ground, you may actually pick that up because you could use it for something. But that would never happen here. How did we have a trillion dollar bailout? How did we have a two trillion dollar stimulus package? Where do all those dollars come from? The budget, the budget for 2011 is 3.6 trillion dollars. People go, oh my God, you, you mean Congress is gonna spend 3.6 trillion dollars? No. Well, I thought you said the debt was, yeah, the, the, the budget is $3.6 trillion. They're gonna spend $4.6 trillion. We are going into debt another trillion dollars just in 2011. But it can't happen here. The economy's not gonna crash. That's crazy talk. The economy is crashing. That's why nobody can come to my constitution class because $100 is just too much. But we'll spend an average of $800 on a World Series ticket and as much as $4,000 for a Super Bowl ticket and there were no cheerleaders. <laughs> I don't know what is wrong with America. I have been learning about the constitution for 30 years. I've been teaching my class for 12 years. I've run for president, I've run for Congress, I had a radio program for two years on the internet trying to motivate people. And they go, well, things are changing. You know, we've got the Oath Keepers, we've got the Tea Parties, we've got, you know, all these different organizations. Doing what? Oh, sitting around and talking about how bad it is. Great! That's going to accomplish a lot. You need food to eat. You know, you know so we're going to sit around and we're going to have a meeting. We're going to talk about planting a garden. We'll talk about how big the garden should be. We can debate what we're going to plant. We can calculate how much water we're going to have to water the thing. And we're going to just have keep meetings. You know, meeting after meeting. Well, we got to have another meeting. We still don't have any food. Yeah, because you're not doing a damn thing. You may be hungry, but even that hasn't motivated you. The motive, like motor, it means energy, it means doing something. It implies some form of action. I don't see any action. What are we waiting for? I mean, we are apt to shut our eyes against the painful uh, truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. How many people have to lose their job? You know, Ron Reagan is famous for saying that a recession is when your neighbor loses your, uh, his job and a depression is when you lose yours. I mean, I, I, I don't know how bad it's going to get. I seriously, I mean, I was naive. I thought, you know, I know that things are going to get worse, I know the economy is going to get tough, and that is what is going to motivate America. As the economy continues to get worse, more and more people are going to wake up, they're going to be motivated, they're going to be taking my class, I'll be teaching a hundred people every weekend, I'm going to have to start, you know, getting large auditoriums, you know, I'm really going to be lighting the fires of liberty. Just the opposite has happened. As the economy has gotten worse, you know, no, nope, sorry. I did a two-hour webinar for twenty dollars. I figure that's short. It's you know cheap. 
I had a woman call and ask me if it was okay to register for the webinar and then have seven of her friends come over and just watch the computer at her house. Because what, $20 is too much to spend for your life, for liberty, for the pursuit of happiness? You want to get other people to chip in on your 20 bucks. Well, I can't control it. I mean, I have no idea how many people are sitting around your computer. I'm not like the CIA. <laughs> but I'm also not going to give you permission to rip me off so that you can go to sleep and feel good about it. We have our convention here, the Indiana Libertarian Party. Here, these are, there are 6.4 million people in Indiana. And here we are in like a medium-sized room. We don't even have all the libertarians here. How do you expect to accomplish anything? I had somebody say, well, you know, there was this big rally in Texas. Really? Yeah, about 400 people at, at the Capitol. 21 million people in Texas. And you think that 400 people with a couple of signs are going to actually make a difference? He said, well, you know, the people were up in arms. I go, were they pistols or rifles? I go, no, they had signs. They had a guy with a megaphone. Okay, so they were up in sign. They were up in voice. Don't tell me that they were up in arms unless you can smell gun smoke. That is being up in arms. People, I get phone calls literally every day. It, it's up to an average about four or five phone calls a day. Oh, Mr. Badnark, I, what are we going to do? They never like my answer. It's like, well, we're going to you know, have to get a rope and hang these bastards. <gasps> oh, my God, you can't say that. Oh, my gosh, that's, you know, like hostile and violent. And it's like, well, yeah. Well, how do you think you're going to make the changes? You're going to make another phone call to your representative? Gonna write a letter to the editor. What? Go out there on the you know the Indianapolis law and you shake your finger at them sternly. You think that's gonna help? That's not motivational. When I was in the hospital a year and a half ago, I got two shopping bags filled with get well cards. And and I appreciate the sentiment, everybody was concerned for my safety. I got back to mom and dad's house and I started opening all these envelopes. 60 to 70 percent of my get well wishes were, you can't die. It's your job to restore liberty. In other words, get your ass out of that hospital bed and get on the road there, bad narc, because, you know, I'm not satisfied with how much liberty you've, it's your job. You know what I wanted to do? <laughs> That'll show you. I've been telling people for years, long before my heart attack, I've been telling them for years that if I die, liberty is no longer my problem. Apparently I was too subtle. <laughs> it's your problem. <clears throat> It's your job. It's your responsibility. Stop telling me what I should do. I'm, I'm tired of it. Oh, Mr. Bednarik, all you got to do to win is, all I got to do to win? When you run your campaign, you can run your campaign any way you want. Stop telling me what I need to do. In my Constitution class, I talk about rights and responsibilities. They're the same thing. Different spelling for the same thing. Like heads and tails of the same coin. Can I give you heads and keep the tails for myself? No, it's the same coin. So your choice is heads and tails or nothing. There's your choice, all or nothing at all. And does the government 
violate our rights? Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, on, on occasion, we can certainly document where they've come and, you know, messed with us deliberately. In most of the circumstances, we are tired of having the responsibility. We just give those responsibilities to the government. In 1953, we developed the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and basically, <clears throat> basically put the government in charge of schools. Since then, parents have been sending their children off to government-controlled schools. We're going to let the teachers and the government do reading, writing, and arithmetic. I was running for Congress. I spoke to a group of high school students in Texas. I'm trying to talk to them about the Constitution, about civics. No exaggeration. They had coloring books and they had crayons. They are trying to stay inside the lines. And these are high school seniors. Our younger population is functionally illiterate. Texting, L-O-L. We can't even spell it out. And then when we do, we misspell it. People register for my class all the time. Everything is in lowercase. It's like, you didn't learn any grammar at all? And then parents are gonna be pissed because, well, my children just haven't learned the values I wanted them to learn. Why the hell not? Because you gave that responsibility to the government. You told me the most important thing in your life were your children. Oh, I love my children. So that you gave your children to the government? Who's responsible for feeding those children? You. Who's responsible for sheltering those children? You. Who's responsible for teaching those children all the skills and values that they're supposed to have? You. Who's supposed to put food in your mouth? You. That's your responsibility. Who's responsible for your retirement? Well, the government. Our parents and grandparents were lied to by FDR, who said, we're the government, we're bigger and smarter than you are. You just give us your Social Security money. We're going to invest it for you. And when you are ready to retire, you're going to have more money than you know what to do with. How many people have heard this conversation? Yep, mom and I are going on another vacation. We just can't spend that Social Security money fast. <laughs> she just keeps piling it up in Xerox boxes in the spare room. We're going to have to get a storage locker here pretty soon. Do you know anybody on Social Security who feels secure? They're terrified because they've got to decide whether they're going to buy food or medication this month because they can't afford both. So you gave your responsibility to the government and now you're pissed because the government's not doing your job well enough. Okay, that makes no sense to me at all. None. When I'm not teaching people about the Constitution or standing at a microphone ranting, trying to motivate people, I'm frequently out at the airport, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes, usually with terrified students in my hands. And I do that to relax. <laughs> Who do you think packs my parachute? You. Come on. It's my body falling through the sky at 120 miles an hour. I'm the guy that's going to resemble a pepperoni pizza if the parachute doesn't open. I will share my lunch with you. I will loan you my car keys. and. You know, I mean, I'll give you just about everything I got. Don't touch my parachute. I'm not even kidding. That is my life. That is my responsibility. The last thing I want to do with the last 10 seconds of my life is use your name in vain. <laughs> if a woman goes to McDonald's, orders a hot cup of coffee, and God knows what McDonald's was thinking, they handed her a hot cup of coffee. And she has the 
she puts it where? <laughs> and then she's going to file a multi-million dollar lawsuit against McDonald's because she was an idiot. Nobody wants to take responsibility anymore. Everybody wants Ron Paul. We're going to all support Ron Paul. All Ron Paul has to do is win the election, become president, and all of our problems are, are solved. You're all, I mean, you guys make armchair quarterbacks look like they're actually participating. What is it going to take? Tell me. What is it going to take to motivate you? What can I say that will actually get you out of your chair and doing something? How many people, by show of hands, and be honest, how many people have at least a year's supply of food stored up? Okay, get their addresses. <laughs> okay, let's do that again. Hold up your hand and look around the room. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting that we go and take their food because there wouldn't be enough. What I'm suggesting is that you guys are the choir. You guys are the ones that are supposed to be really smart and three or four of you have food stored up. How many of you have divested all of your paper money into silver and gold? What I can. Oh, what I can. Okay. It, yeah, I got that's what they gave me for my 20 years. I had someone call me. I have been preaching silver and gold. I, I, my joke is, you invest in precious metals, gold, silver, and lead. Okay, what's the lead for? To protect the gold and silver. <laughs> Again, apparently I'm being too subtle. I have been promoting gold and silver. When I left California in 97, I liquidated my stock. My IRA, gone. And then my manager said, well, how much? I said, 100% of it. He goes, well, they're going to give you 100%. They're going to, you're going to lose like 20% to the IRS. I don't care. I would rather have 80% in my hand than 100% on a piece of paper that I can wad up and throw away. I want it in my hand. And I did that in 1997. Everything, oh, my God, what a radical and extremist. So I finally had somebody call me. I convinced them, convinced them to invest in silver in December. And they called me to say that with $50 an ounce, they had gotten a 20% increase on their investment. And I said, good thing you didn't invest, invest all of your money. God forbid that you should have a 20% increase on all of your money. Somebody else that I had talked into it a year ago has already had their value double. They bought $20,000 worth of silver and now it's worth $55,000. But, you know, don't have to listen to me. What the hell do I know? I'm just a radical and extremist. I'm constantly talking about, you know, all this violence that's going to happen. Well, it's going to happen whether you're prepared for it or not. John F. Kennedy famously said that if you make peaceful revolution impossible, you make violent revolutions inevitable. Okay? I paraphrased it into a bumper sticker that says, if the First Amendment doesn't work, the Second Amendment will. Okay? When I arrived yesterday, I was having a conversation, and we are just loading magazines going, yep, it's going to be look like the Alamo. I mean, I know I'm going to die. But I'm not going to die alone. My job as a speaker is to be motivational. And one of the ways that I try to do that is to evaluate my audience, take them to the edge of their comfort level and then push them two steps further. I, I was invited to speak at the Texas convention uh, just about a year ago and Texans are proud. We love Texas. And anybody going to go speak in Texas 
mention the Alamo and you'll get a standing ovation. Period. It's, it's that easy. We are so simple in Texas. We love the Alamo. It was a shrine. And so I, I talk about the Alamo, William, uh, William Travis, you know, lying in the sand. And I go, how many people are willing to die for liberty? And they're Texans. I mean, most of the room are raising their hand. I got the Alamo. <laughs> well, I got a reaction. So, you know, they're all, they're all willing to die at the Alamo. I go, why? Why? If you're dead, then you don't have life. You certainly don't have liberty or property. You're dead. So what's the value of dying for liberty? And so I quoted George Patton, you know, a war is not won by dying for your country. A war is won by making the other poor bastard die for his country. And I said, so the question, the legitimate question is not, are you willing to die for liberty? The real question is, are you willing to kill for liberty? And everybody just go like, Ugh! you can hear everybody taking a collective gasp. You know, and they're probably in the back going, did he really say that? They go, yeah, that's bad, Norik. Of course he said it. I'm willing to say the things that people are not are afraid to think. We're headed for an economic disaster. There's going to be another civil war in the United States because I know at least some of us are not going to go quietly. We're not giving up. You may be big enough to kill me, but you're not big enough to scare me. So, Patrick Henry says, it is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has already begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? Why are you still sitting here in the chair listening? What is it going to take to motivate you? If somebody can tell me that during the, the you know, convention, I will do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Give me liberty or give me death. Failure is not an option. It is your responsibility. Thank you. We have a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions for five minutes or so? Well, maybe you can run away. No questions? Margaret. They keep on talking about why are we still sitting here. What would be your suggestions of what we should be doing, Michael? Well, things are so bad at the moment, you need to be protecting your life and the life of your family. Literally. Store at least a year to a year and a half supply of food because the shelves are going to be empty. And if you're hungry, the government can convince you to do all sorts of stuff that you would not normally do. You know, I'm never going to get a chip under my arm unless they're offering me a sandwich that I haven't had in seven days. So physically prepare for food. Convert all of your money. If you've got nickels and dimes in your pocket, gather them together into $50 and buy another ounce of silver. Because silver is already at $50. It is, I, I forget how much it's gone up. It, it, 10 years ago was $5. So it's gone up 1,000% in just the last 10 years, and now we're hitting the curve where it's gonna be going up. You know, like, but only invest the money that you still wanna have, you know? God forbid that you should be one person not sitting with worthless Federal Reserve notes in your hand. And again, if you don't have a gun, buy one. And lots of ammunition. If you need to learn how to shoot that gun, call me. I mean, I went to Austin, Texas just uh, about three weeks ago 
And my plan was to teach one young lady how to shoot. On her Facebook page, she had a silhouette target that looked like Swiss cheese. I mean, there were holes in it, but there was no pattern. If I shot a target like that, I would stop drinking, throw that target away, and never show anybody. <laughs> so I called her and I said, you know, uh, your gun training isn't finished. And so I started out, I was going to teach her how to shoot. By the time I got to the gun range, I had six people. And all of them were going, oh my God, I've never shot that well in my life. Okay. So literally, you need to protect yourself, your family, and then you start to network with people that you're going to be able to trust because you're not going to be able to survive alone. You need other people to think like you do so that you can trade, you know, string beans for, you know, for corn or something like that. It is that bad. You know, if you even if you've never been a Boy Scout, go out and buy a copy of the Boy Scout handbook. At very least it will it will give you basic survival skills that you're going to need. One more question, please. How high do you think silver is going to reach? Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how high silver is going to reach. It's going to be depend on um, how valuable people think it is. And as more and more people are waking up, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pre I am predicting that it will go at least as high as $200. At least that high. So invest more still if you got <laughs> it, yeah, you know, the answer is silver and gold. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, which silver or gold stock should I buy? You shouldn't buy anything where they're going to hand you a piece of paper. You want it in your hand. You want physical silver. One more? Oh, just, yeah, you, you briefly mentioned gold. Uh, is there, I know, of course, silver is a lot more accessible to most people, but what's your pos position as far as gold goes? Because it's obviously the ratio that they used to say of 16 to 1 uh, in terms of the cost of gold to silver is still way skewed. Right. Gold is, you know, significantly more expensive, so you can store it in a smaller area. I mean, that's the advantage. So, I mean, if you've got enough paper, if, if you can't, you don't want to have room to store the silver, then you buy gold to reduce the size of your storage. But silver is, because it is more affordable to people, that's the one that is increasing. So at the moment, I mean, if you are trying to do kind of an investment, you know, gold is going to double or triple in price. Silver is going to go seven to eight times as much. So you know, gold is great, but silver, if you can buy the silver now, that's going to get you your best, your highest benefit. Thanks. Thanks, Michael.